Welcome everyone to On Podcast, the Microsoft Podcast, where we talk about Microsoft stuff on a podcast. I am Premier Anderson, and I'm joined by the world's greatest co-host, Arif Bacchus. And we are back. We took a week off. We are back, and in that time, news is piled up. So we're going to try and get through as much as we can in the short amount of time you guys are with us today. So, uh, with that being said, let's get to it. Uh, I want to start telling people what we're going to be talking about. Yeah, Microsoft and Lenovo finally have a device that could compete with Apple M1 Max. Yeah, we'll be talking about the ThinkPad X13s because Lenovo likes to name stuff. They don't like <laughs> uh, to. They like to name stuff very difficultly. Uh, uh, Microsoft is also. We're going to talk about the Microsoft uh, situation in Ukraine, uh, and by that I mean how they are helping and uh, further opening up about what they plan to do uh, in the next coming days or so. And then we also had a big Windows 11 build this week, so we'll get you up to speed in case you missed that out. Yeah, and then we have our favorite section, which is a fast recap, where we're going to kind of run down um, leaked uh, stuff in Windows 11, which uh, includes the stickers feature. Uh, we'll try and explain that as best we can. And then we also have some flight sim views, because it's now finally on Xbox Cloud Gaming. Yeah, and then we have the redesigned Microsoft Store, uh, the web version, and what that could mean for the future of uh, both the Windows 11 app and maybe a PWA version of it coming soon. And we also have some news about Microsoft's deal with Nuance finally closing out. Yeah, and for those of you who just need a quick refresher, uh, that's AI and uh, how Microsoft's going to kind of build that into tools for Azure. We'll go into more of that in a second. Uh, and then we have our week ahead which will be teasing the review of a Dell monitor, I believe you are getting. Yeah, I can't talk much about it right now, but you guys will find out in a few days of what exactly it is. But just want to get it out there. Look out for a fantastic Dell review coming up on Tuesday. Yeah, we also have Edge 99 is, in a, is stable, I guess. Uh, so we're gonna be, they're going to be shipping that out pretty soon, I suppose, for everyone else. Well, those of us who've been kind of using the dev and uh, uh, beta versions can talk to you about some of the features you guys should expect. And we have an Apple event on March 8th, too. Yeah, uh, we're expecting some hints or discussions about maybe AR or VR goggles uh, with this. So, and we'll, we'll talk about that in light of Microsoft's current situation with HoloLens. So to get us started, let's go ThinkPad X13, the big news right up front. So we titled this podcast, Windows on ARM is Reborn. And... I don't think we need to. It just sounds really cool. Yeah, we don't we don't need to go back to how it was born and where it went wrong. But you guys know the story. Windows RT was a flop. It didn't it didn't work out. They had the Surface Pro X with their custom SQ1 processor in it, and it didn't work out because of emulation. But they went back to the drawing board and they worked with their partners, which Lenovo happens to be one of their partners, and they also worked with Qualcomm and Lenovo on the ThinkPad X13s. And this ThinkPad is unlike any other because it's the first ThinkPad that has an ARM-based processor, which is the Qualcomm Snapdragon 8CX Gen 3 inside. And this is a processor that there were some leaked leak benchmarks earlier this year, and it indicated that the chip could perform just as fast as a 25-watt U-series Intel 12th generation processor. And with the new ThinkPad that uh, Lenovo has right now, they're saying that this uh, chip, uh, the 8CX Gen 3, can boost uh, single-core performance by 57% and multitasking performance by up to 85%. They didn't say against what, but they're making it seem like the X13S is the next big thing and something that could actually compete with what Apple is doing in the ARM space with their M1 processor. Yeah, um, as you mentioned, they didn't compare. They didn't say what they compared it to. But typically, for benchmarks like these, yeah. if they don't specifically call out a company, uh, it's usually to the previous generation. So, I mean, the Gen 2 version of this XEX uh, chip was. I think kind of a little lackluster for, for all intents and purposes. People weren't very impressed by it. Uh, I'm glad they were seeing benchmarks like this, but I believe, uh, at least from early indicators from this chip, that it may run into the same problem Intel did, where it may run hot. And because it's, you know, these are going to be going in fanless designs, there may be a bit of throttling coming from these uh, early on. So right. uh, I think before we get super excited about the possibilities of this, let's just get down to the actual hardware because, you know, that's half of the battle for a lot of people. Yeah, I talked about devices. the processing power. I'll let you get into the hardware because you're the person that normally has all the fun Lenovo toys. 
Exactly. So <laughs> I, uh, if if this comes in across my uh, review table, we'll be reviewing the 13.3 inch uh, laptop, uh, which will be running a 16 point a uh, 16 by 10 aspect ratio. So we'll be getting the you know basically Apple version of uh, display. So you get a little bit uh, more display, which means they're probably gonna be reducing the bezels. Uh, I've seen only the uh, uh, the product images of it. We haven't seen an actual one uh, just yet. I believe they might have had some at MWC, but alas, we're not there. Um, we will also be seeing that this thing I think comes in with a magnesium casing, uh, which again kind of goes a little bit different than the carbon fiber that we're normally yep. used to with the ThinkPad lines. Uh, but one of the things that they were saying with this uh, magnesium uh, is that it, part of it is also made with P PCC plastic. Uh, so, you know, they're trying to use part of the uh, recyclability and, and sustainability aspects of their you know, new push for devices. Um, the other things that we see are we're going to be having Thunderbolt uh, uh, ports on it. I don't see that, uh, at least from the images that we had, that they will be the typical ThinkPad uh, H full HDMI uh, SD card, things like that. So we're going to be moving more towards the Apple and uh, Surface uh, Laptop Studio kind of things, where you're going to have a couple Thunderbolt 4 uh, ports, which will help you know push out uh, 4K displays. Uh, at, uh, it's USB-C because uh, Thunderbolt is an Intel standard. Correct. Yeah. Uh, you're right. You're right. Yes, I apologize. Yes, so we have a USB-C ports. Uh, now, that's the, that's the other question: is that uh, how this will be worked uh, for productivity and we said supportive displays, uh, read and write speeds, things like that. Uh, the other big uh, missing aspect is, like you said, the emulation layer for this. So, as, no matter how much power we have and how much a uh, battery life this thing can be capable of, if it doesn't uh, render, open, render, and read any of these applications that haven't really been optimized for Windows on ARM, just the way they need to be, then it's off or not. So we have to see if Microsoft will announce either prior to build, at build, or shortly after build, uh, an update to the emulation layer that I think they updated in 2020. Was it last year or two? Yeah, last year they updated the emulation so that it supports 64-bit apps, which are basically anything and everything that developers are using now. So there's a the, that that's the reason why Lenovo is all marketing fancy fancy talk about how this performance is good and that performance is good it's because they they work closely together with microsoft to ensure that the common apps that enterprises use because it's a thinkpad it's an enterprise device would work in windows 11 through that app ensure and that uh, emulate 64-bit uh, app emulation yeah and this is the other thing too is uh, i think we had mentioned that there might be uh, leaks or talks of a Surface laptop kind of coming with this same yep. chip. And yep. one of the bigger uh, benefits of this, aside from, you know, um, all of the power and uh, battery is connectivity. Yep. So uh, this, specific uh, this specific chip supports millimeter wave for 5G connectivity. So uh, as Air is making <clears throat> the big push for 5G, you'll be able to uh, hop on, you know, that faster network as well with everybody else, anywhere you go. So if you're on a train, if you're well, not in a plane, but if you're on a train, if you're on a place that allow you to be mobile and use 5G, these devices will be great for stuff like that. But that's not all that's new in this ThinkPad X13S. They also have the Pluton security chip inside, which was kind of a big deal when Microsoft first brought it up because we're used to secure core PCs and the TPM chips. But the Pluton security chip, if you remember when they introduced it back in 2020, it's basically a cloud to chip solution where they could use the Pluton chip and give it firmware updates uh, weekly, monthly, bi-weekly, whatever it is, to uh, keep your system updated against the most common cybersecurity threats. So this is one of the first products that has the Pluton chip inside. And there are a couple of benefits that Microsoft went over when the announcement of the ThinkPad went out. They said you could, up, they could, like I said, they could update the firmware of the chip. Uh, it also protects against physical attacks because it's built into the SOC itself and not a separate bridge like how a TPM chip is. And they also mentioned that the trust that Microsoft and Qualcomm have together working on this uh, for a, a whole bunch, a couple of years now. It's a technology that has been in the Xbox for a while now, and now it's finally coming over to Windows PCs. And not the only PCs that will have it, by the way. 
I believe AMD at CES, they announced that the 6000 series Ryzen chips will also have support for the Pluton chip uh, security processor. Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot to look forward to. Um, but again, at the end of the day, it comes down to applications running yep. smoothly, which is what uh, Apple was able to nail. So Microsoft, uh, Qualcomm, and developers are going to need to really take the next year if this is going to be the, the push, the final push. You know, we've always had Windows and ARM, at least for the last like five years, kind of stutter stop, stutter stop. If this is the big push, we need to all really kind of, you know, nail down that application uh, layer. And maybe we'll start seeing better, nicer, thinner clients with longer battery life. I got to try one out uh, ahead of uh, Lenovo's Marble That's War right. Congress thing. And uh, it's pretty impressive to me how thin and how light it feels. And the fact that it's fanless, I'm used to my computers having fans and the whirring and the, the blowing effect you get when you open 15 Chrome tabs or 10, 15 Edge tabs. But this thing I opened, I think it was like six or 12 different tabs in Edge. And they also had a sample Teams client running in the background, as well as even Google Chrome and, and Skype. And I opened them all at once. And the processor on the thing, it barely pegged to like, 8% or 10%, even with all of that stuff open. So to me, it seems like it's very promising. And I know you're probably looking forward to getting it in your in your hands and doing some more physical tests. But I think it's a very big deal for Microsoft and for ARM in general and the Windows on ARM space. Yeah, I wish I, I wish I'd have like known you were going to that because you're under embargo, so we couldn't talk about <laughs> it. But I would have told you to try out Adobe. I know that they uh, well, it was it was it was like a sample thing that they yeah. had sitting. You can't go and install all kinds. No, of but you could ask. You could ask them to be like, "Hey." Uh, usually, they they were standing over my shoulder and looking at me <laughs> and looking at what I was doing on it. I'm like, "Hey, this is what I do on every single laptop. It's not just this Qualcomm that's laptop." That's what I'm saying. <laughs> You'd be like, "Hey, uh, can I try?" Because you know that's going to be the first thing we yeah. hear about these reviews. It's like, "Oh, they it couldn't export work. it. It took forever to open Premiere and blah right. blah blah." So. Uh, if if they can get that out of the gate and we can get these YouTubers off the back and let developers, you know, get a chance to breathe and work on it, I think we're we're going to be in good shape. But uh, on a more serious note, uh, I'm sure you guys are familiar with what's happening right now in Ukraine. Uh, Russia launched a large-scale invasion of Ukraine, uh, sent, sending in troops, uh, launching missiles, and also a large-scale cyber attack on Ukrainian institutions. And much of the world has come out against the Russian aggression, including the United States and the European Union. And I know this podcast is not a political one, but it's something that a lot of tech companies in general have gotten involved in. And Microsoft in particular is gotten involved in a big way, in four specific ways. And I'll let you get into what Microsoft is doing in Ukraine right now. Yeah, as you mentioned, uh, on February 24th, Russia launched a large-scale invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and so uh, I believe uh, right prior to the invasion, they also started to do a uh, cyber attack uh, yep. where they kind of uh, preceded the uh, physical invasion and actual tanks and missiles with a cyber attack to kind of take down and, and weaken the defenses. Uh, I think uh, three hours into that attack, Microsoft was able to alert uh, the Ukraine officials uh, that they were using a digital infrastructure known as Foxblade malware package. Uh, to kind of, like I said, go in and infect systems and with the idea or the goal of, of weakening the uh, infrastructure for Ukraine. Uh, so that's one way they've started to help. And since then, I think we are now, uh, what are we into, S six days, seven days yep. of this attack. And Microsoft is doing is taking more steps uh, to kind of help uh, protect and help aid the uh, Ukraine uh, nation. Uh, and then a blog post by Microsoft President Vice Chair Brad Smith uh, provided a short-term summary of how Microsoft is going to respond with their four key areas. The first is protecting Ukraine from cyber attacks, so they're going to continue to do that. The second is protecting against state-sponsored disinformation campaigns, uh, and that is, you know, uh, news coming in and out. So presumably things that are going to be on Bing or, or in searches or like that are going to be uh, a little more scrutinized and filtered through. Uh, the third is humanitarian, humanitarian assistance. Uh, and I believe that is going to be more like donations from the company, from employee employee match donations, things like that, to help refugees and whatnot uh, during this during this time. Get people to uh, places outside of Ukraine if they if possible. Then the final stage is protecting Microsoft employees. And again, I, I believe that goes for both employees uh, internationally and those 
uh, here who have family and things like that of that nature. Uh, as for uh, what's ahead, Microsoft that says that it remains especially concerned about ongoing attacks in the Ukrainian uh, financial sector, agriculture sector, and even emergency response services and humanitarian aid efforts. Uh, so again, there, Microsoft says it's going to continue to work with Ukraine as well as NATO, the American officials, European Union officials, and advise them on any issues or any new types of malware, things that kind of uh, come up in the upcoming days because, you know, we are far from the end of yep. this uh, incursion. And then also today, uh, Friday, which is March 4th, Microsoft also announced that it's suspending, quote unquote, new sales in Russia in response to the attack on Ukraine. Not sure what new sales consists of, but I believe Apple also stopped selling its products in Russia. So it's pretty much a response to what Apple and other tech companies have already been doing. Yeah, it's going to be a back and forth between Russia and uh, both U.S. and international based companies. Uh, Russia, I believe, came out today or might have been last night saying that they're banning Facebook and other social yeah. media platforms. So, I mean, while everyone's kind of uh, pointing their, uh, you know, uh, uh, weapon of choice to kind of discourage this uh, aggression by Russia, Russia is also aiming back. And again, we are in a global economy. Uh, where, you know, all of this stuff affects everybody at the end of the day. So, uh, you know, again, we're not a political uh, podcast or even a website, but we will try to keep you guys up to date on all of the technology, all of the uh, policies, things that go into things that could affect you uh, on a daily basis. And what you do use on a daily basis is Windows 11. And there was another big Windows Insider bill. I know you had a chance to download and play with it. Yeah, this one uh, was, I mean, it, I know we, we titled it another big Windows 11 build, and it was by size and by downloads type and speed a big one. But I, you know, I had to ask you off mic <laughs> what actually changed. You know, it took me about uh, a, a roughly 30 minutes to do this download, and I was expecting, you know, all kinds of new features and all kinds of new things to play with. And I believe we got two new things essentially. You want to tell people what they are? Well, the first one, uh, pretty much uh, Zach was happy about it because it finally got rid of that old open with dialog that's been left over from Windows 8 and Windows 10. It's now cleaner and you have one click options to change it, change a specific app to your default app. Uh, it looks just like it would, just like you expect out of Windows 11, rounded corners, uh, the fluent design effect. You get the whole drift there. And there's also a new... Windows security option. Uh, let me just check the notes here to tell you what it is. It's called the new smart app controls in uh, Windows security. Not sure what it is because Microsoft didn't get into specifics, but we're assuming it's something that uh, watches what apps you use. So if it senses something that's strange, it, it basically will alert you, hey, this app isn't right uh, and uh, you shouldn't open it or you will block access to it. And yeah, it's only I, it's only something that's available in a clean install right now, not enabled by default or anything. But Microsoft says that they'll share more specifics on it heading into the future. Yeah, if I had to guess, I feel like they're going to take the uh, mobile security approach to this, uh, yeah. where I think Google and obviously Apple kind of alert people when uh, apps are using uh, part of your uh, sensors in the background. So, yeah. you know, things like, you know, we have a new microphone icon that'll light up. Uh, we have, you know, uh, it'll probably let you know when webcams are open, things of that nature. And in addition to the same with the Edge uh, browser kind of give you the big red screen saying, hey, you know, hey, we think something is wrong with this. We You don't trust it. Uh, I believe if you go and try and download uh, x86 apps uh, or Windows 32 apps, things like that yeah. off the web, that you'll get this prompt beforehand and probably have to go through several dialogues in order to uh, give, give uh, the app access to Windows 11 at this point. And there's also something new with Windows Update. Our editor-in-chief, Kip, he was complaining, Windows Update always bugs you at the random times to install updates. And now... Apparently, Windows Update will try to schedule update installations at times of day when doing so will result in lower carbon emissions. So Windows will decide, hey, uh, there's a windmill or there's uh, there's like uh, thermal power or efficient power, and now I'm going to install updates. <laughs> but Microsoft <laughs> says that the feature will only be enabled when your PC is plugged in and regional carbon intensity data is available from their partners at Electricity Map or what time? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I don't know how to feel about this because I don't know exactly <laughs> how, 
how it's going to be applied. Like I don't, I don't see how it benefits anyone at all, but at least they're trying to be eco-friendly. Yeah, I don't know if they're going to try and update these when they know your power source is coming, like you said, from a windmill, solar power, or something else. Uh, if they find out that your power source is coming from fossil <laughs> fuel, or are they just going to tell you best No of more luck? updates. No more updates yeah. for you. <laughs> I mean, as much as I appreciate that, what I would like them to do is kind of do, again, like we said, where you're on mobile, where the uh, operating system learns your behavior and mood. And I know we're doing much more activities, a much broader range of activities, and at different times uh, on our PCs, but we tend to have a workflow uh, that's very you know, typical each day. Like, you know, a lot of people work from anywhere between six to, you know, seven or whatever, if you work long hours, things like that. But your PC should start to understand, especially when you have peak hours. If you're, you know, someone who's in Excel and exporting stuff, and you're doing that from, you know, nine to one in the morning, or nine to one in the afternoon, they should know, like, hey, that's his heavy usage time. That's when his his memory and his processing power speak, uh, peaks. Let's try and schedule, you know, at 8.30, 9 o'clock. Or if you're a night person, if you're creative and you get all your video editing started at 7 o'clock and you work until 3 in the morning, it should know, like, hey, you know, again, peak processing time and, and hours. Let's schedule this at 6 o'clock in the morning when, you know, it seems to be office PC or something like that. And then confirm. Say, hey, you know, we've noticed uh, that your battery usage and your power usage corresponds with these hours. Would you like us to schedule uh, the restart at this point? Hopefully they'll get there. I, I feel like they are kind of getting there with those warnings. And there's also a bunch of other smaller features. I I know we talked about a couple of podcasts ago about the new uh, Microsoft account settings option in the settings. Well, they now added your uh, more of the Microsoft 365 plugins there, so you'll be able to manage your car, uh, your credit cards or your debit cards, and see when things are auto renew. And they also added a new out of box experience for the Android, uh, for the Android phone integrations with your phone. So you'll be able to scan a QR code during setup and get your phone set up right away. And they're also promising that more uh, new ISOs are coming out for people who might want to clean install and experience that out of box experience. And there are a couple of other smaller changes like the animations for hovering over apps when creating folders and cleaner touch gestures, updates to pages across the settings app to adopt WinUI and the ability to mute and unmute your audio by clicking on the little sound icon in the taskbar. Yeah, so what we're saying bottom line is, is that the beta and dev versions have a lot more features than what we got yep. for the full release. For So those of you who are sitting on Windows 11 saying, eh, this really isn't that great and I don't see what's going on, uh, you may want to click over to beta or dev. Uh, I believe it's next month we'll have an yep. opening uh, and try out a lot of these features because this is showing the promise of Windows 11 uh, versus kind of what they have. And again, I don't know when, because I think they're moving to cadence to, is it one big update a year now? One big update a year, yep. So you could be waiting for these great new features when you uh, for a while, or you could be trying them out now. And the bills are pretty stable. I haven't had any crashes or anything like that in, in quite some time. So again, you can move over to beta if you'd like to try some of this stuff out. And now it's time for our fast recap. It's been a week since we've been here, so I'll, but uh, it doesn't change. We'll get 10 minutes on the clock here for a couple of different topics. Yeah, we'll start off with uh, another Windows 11 feature. Uh, that's kind of a head scratcher. This may take our entire time to figure out, but we <laughs> a leaked look at the Windows 11 sticker feature. And even seeing it, I still don't know why there was code and time allotted for this thing. Could you, maybe maybe you have better insight than I do. I mean, if you're handing your PC to a child or a kid, I know you have kids, maybe they might like it because you're able to right-click on the desktop, uh, go to the... The, uh, the the monitor customization menu and then you get a little emoji picker like you know when that period it brings up the little box and you could pick different cute little stickers like that there's a bunch of cats and stuff and you could drag them all over your desktop and leave it in the corner i mean it's a nifty little trick but no one asked for it but at least microsoft is trying something new here i suppose i mean like i said you could do all of this, you know, if I have my child or what I have to let them do is I open up Paint and let them go crazy. Microsoft Paint does all kinds of crazy <laughs> things like this. And guess what? At the end of the day, I close it out and my desktop remains as clean as I like it. But, uh, it, you know, like you said, maybe this is for people who want, uh, those people who decorate the lid of their laptop full of stickers and they want that to be reflected on the inside of their computer as well. I don't know. It just seems like uh, some team, maybe one or two people got together in Microsoft and was like, hey, 
we got some extra code. We want to toss it into Windows. What do you guys think of stickers? And nobody said no just yet. Cause... But it's still something that's turned off by default, according yeah, to the yeah. leaker. So it's not something that they'll force you to use. It's just turned off by default. I'll tell you right now, news and weather was turned off by default for a while, too. <laughs> just saying. Right. Uh, good point. <laughs> And the other story, second story here in Fast Recap, is that Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 is finally on Xbox Cloud Gaming. So if you don't have money to buy a fancy gaming PC to play Flight Sim, or you don't have money to buy an Xbox Series X or Series S to play a Flight Sim, you can now just power it up and play from your phone or any computer and even a fridge like we were talking about a couple months ago. Just uh, get an, grab an Xbox controller and go and play and enjoy Fly the Skies through the world through your web browser. I wouldn't recommend a fridge because people, <laughs> at least in my house, they're constantly in the fridge. It's just going to distract you. But as you said, uh, it is awesome that you're able to kind of play this game on any screen now. Uh, now, I don't know the level. Even of the original ride. Xbox consoles, by the way, because yeah. before you couldn't play it because uh, it wasn't powerful enough. But now everything is just streamed through the web. Yeah, uh, I want to see. I want to get your thoughts on the level of quality when you compare the two to an actual a dedicated processing power and, and storage versus what's in the cloud and see if there's any visual uh, degradation whatsoever. Or if, you know, it's still a great experience and now Microsoft's moved to the cloud, which again is going to be uh, great for them, uh, you know, when they're pitching xCloud against uh, Stadia and Luna and some other things coming up in the future. And coming in the future is a redesigned Microsoft Store web app, which you didn't know about until we talked about it off mic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all of like 20 minutes ago. But uh, it's it's actually interesting. I, I went and visited it real quick and kind of went through it. And you and I were both discussing how well organized this one seems to be compared to the actual app uh, on Windows 10 and Windows 11. Um, and it's not to say that the Windows 10 and Windows 11 app doesn't look great and isn't a very fluid app. It's very nice. Uh, the animation is great. I love the way they've kind of evolved it. But uh, when you go to the web version, you get a side panel full of categories that are much more explicit in what the uh, apps are than what you do on uh, the Windows app uh, and on the store or Windows uh, PCs. So you get listings like productivity that's beyond just what you get for uh, uh, in the app. You get government and politics, you get medical, you get multimedia design, navigation and maps, personal finance. Like these things are broken out. And this led me to ask you, could this be the future of just the one combined app, kind of like you're going to do with, uh, what is it, uh, Outlook? Seems to me like they're trying to get the pieces of the puzzle together and try and make one core place where you could go to get everything. I mean, the Windows 11 store is always is already somewhere that you could go to get everything you need. It has Xbox games. It links you out to Xbox. But I, I, I see where you're going with it. Teams apps has its own team store. But if you could merge everything together under one whole base, it'd be a one stop shop for everything. Yeah, and this could work for those Windows on ARM uh, devices yep. as well yep. uh, in the future. Moving on, we have our last thing, which is Microsoft's Nuance deal has finalized as of this morning. So the $19.7 billion acquisition that was started almost a year and a half ago has finally come to an end. And for the, again, like as I mentioned earlier, uh, that's Microsoft buying a fairly up and coming uh, AI, a conversational AI software platform that they're going to be embedding into Azure with the intent of helping businesses specifically in finance and uh, in healthcare, more or less. If you go to their website, I believe they have a partner website already yep. that is very uh, heavily influenced with images from healthcare. It seems to be kind of like the push for it. But they will be doing other groups uh, such as retail and telecommunications. And what they, you know, again, they haven't explicitly said what their uh, intent is just yet because they're waiting for it to finalize and kind of integrate everything and probably see how well uh, the new uh, or the current CEO works with Scott Guthrie, who we'll be reporting to uh, in the Microsoft Cloud Plus AI uh, platform team, see how well those all work together. But if I had to take a, a leap of faith and guess, uh, what they're going to be doing is basically uh, adding this AI process to help streamline both consumer interactions with healthcare. So if you were going to go, uh, you know, uh, check your medications or uh, 
talk to your doctor about preventative measures, things like that, it, you know, these more intensive uh, interactions with one-on-one -on -one persons, they can now start to be autom uh, automated and processed, but also feel intuitive and natural at the same time versus like press nine for your doctor, press 10 <laughs> for his assistant, stuff like that. Uh, and that is going to be also done for uh, businesses as well. They're going to be able to kind of streamline their own processes and uh, kind of be able to transfer data much more fluidly. And that's it. I think we hit fast recap in under 10 minutes. Uh, even though we've been gone for a week, we still have it in us. Bam. Uh, <laughs> so now we're going to be moving to the week ahead, uh, which I will let you get into this part because this is all you. Yeah, I have a new Dell product that I want to review, uh, talk about on Tuesday. Can't talk about it right now because it's under embargo, but we have a fancy Dell review coming up on Tuesday. And I promise you, it'll be something that you don't want to miss. With that being said, now we're going to move <laughs> over to Edge 99 uh, in Stable. Uh, so what is that about? Yeah, there's just a Edge 99 hit the stable channel today on Friday. So if you didn't install it and you you uh, you missed out today, you might be auto updated to Edge 99 in the coming days and in the coming weeks ahead. But it has a couple of new features. The main one of which is the ability to set a custom primary password to protect all of your saved passwords. It's basically adding another layer of security so someone can't just grab your computer and sign in and go in your bank and withdraw all of your money and, and you know, you know, the deal. And then there's also a, another a feature where you're able to personalize multi-profile experiences with profile preferences for sites. So basically open a specific site in a different profile. And then Edge 100 should be coming up in a couple of weeks. And Microsoft wants people to be aware of the change in the user uh, the user string in Ed, Microsoft Edge, you'll go from a two-digit number to a three-digit number. So if you're a developer or web developer or someone who runs a website, it's something to keep in mind. Yeah, um, and it's weird because I've I've downloaded each version of, you know, uh, Dev, Canary, uh, Beta, and, uh, you know, the regular. And I've been on the Dev, so I just want to make sure I wasn't going to confuse people with features that I've been trying out that they won't be getting get the stable <laughs> version. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of see, we had uh, navigating PDF documents using uh, page thumbnails is yep, coming that, to that too, this I version. That, yeah. uh, we have a personalized, like you said, multi-profile experience, three-digit version numbers, customary, prime, uh, customary primary passwords, and list of domains for which user password managers interface UIs and save and fills are disabled. So that you mentioned all that kind of stuff. Uh, I wish you guys could start trying some of the stuff I've been playing with with the dev version, which brings, I think, uh, news at the bottom, sports. Uh, I think it's, yeah, you get sports and news at the bottom of, of the browser. You also get like a new panel for, uh, I believe, managing web apps and things of that nature. It's pretty super cool. So hopefully that stuff will start making its way uh, onto you guys in the main channel. And then we also have an Apple event coming up on March 8th. I know it's not an Apple podcast, but we oh, sometimes, let's get started. We have another we hour sometimes to talk, talk about Apple, about Apple <laughs> stuff and compare it to Microsoft stuff. And they have an event coming up on March 8th, which people think could be a big one. Yeah. Uh, I mean, everyone says this about every Apple event. Because <laughs> nobody knows what's going on. So they just throw everything at the, at the uh, kitchen wall. Um, so, you know, everyone's kind of predicting that um, they're going to be talking about the M2, now I don't know if they're going to be releasing it or if they're just going to talk about what's in store for uh, Macs coming in the future, Mac minis, uh, laptops. Uh, I think they're going to try and update them, maybe the MacBook Air uh, with this new chip, things like that. So we'll see how far Intel and, and uh, Qualcomm might fall behind already before they get their new chips out to everybody. Uh, the other big thing that I am predicting because of everyone that's trying to read the tea leaves is that they may actually start discussing their AR, VR approach. Uh, again, I don't expect hardware, not this year, but they may be getting developers on board, may talk about it more at WWDC, but I do think they're going to hint at uh, their AR approach. And I say all this to kind of put this in context with what we heard about Microsoft last month, kind of in disarray uh, with their AR project and mixed reality going forward with uh, kind of you know rumors about uh, everyone leaving and that there's no third version coming and that, uh, you know, there's been stagnation on the team, you know, so it'll be interesting to kind of juxtapose what Apple's going to be kind of starting up with versus what Microsoft is either currently or slowing down on in their AR uh, vision. 
And also look out for new 5G iPhones and iPads as well. The iPhone SE could be getting a, f- a new 5G ver- variant with the same design and same thing with the iPad Air. Same design, but just a new, I think it's a Bionic A15 uh, chip under the hood and also 5G support. Yeah, so again, carriers are trying to get everyone on board. So expect to see deals for those things, trade-ins, all the kind of stuff, all for 5G. And do you have any fun hardware that you want to talk about? Yeah, and I've been teasing it uh, for like the last three weeks. So I'll be almost, I'll be done with my review next week of the Legion uh, Tower. I'm looking at it right now. Um, So uh, again, for those of you who couldn't afford to get a Tower PC to play uh, Flight Simulator, we'll be giving one away. So stay tuned and uh, this may be the device for you. Uh, If anything, Get it just for the uh, graphics uh, chip in there because they are so hard to come by these days with the chip shortage. Uh, I am also reviewing the uh, ThinkPad uh, P something or other. I have a lot of ThinkPads, but that <laughs> one is that one should be coming up pretty soon as well. Uh, and I believe oh, and a webcam. Uh, Next ago sent me a 4K webcam. Uh, I'm not using it currently because I'm at work and I have that one set up at the house. But uh, that has been pretty amazing. And those are relatively inexpensive. You can get those all on Amazon. So uh, I will let you know how well that turns out. And I think that's it. Uh, We got through everything we wanted to talk about, as usual, in 45 minutes or less. Yes, we thank you guys for sticking with us and lasting all this way through the podcast. And we appreciate it. Uh, thank you for coming back every uh, week. Uh, you can find me at Mindhead1 during the week uh, on Twitter. Where can people find you? Be back, Jern. Yeah, and for all news on Microsoft, Microsoft related things, Microsoft in other countries, uh, <laughs> you can visit us on Microsoft uh, on Twitter uh, under that um, Twitter handle, or you can go to our website on Microsoft.com. Or you can, if you're into gaming, you can go to our Pinterest page uh, and find out all kinds of things about gaming on there. We also, again, we're trying to grow our Instagram. So if you want to see clips of just small clips of the podcast or if you want to just kind of see memes and things like that, visit our Instagram as well. All right, everyone. See you again soon.